Amen. Thank you for that beautiful reminder of God's amazing grace. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 4 this morning. Genesis chapter 4, I want to thank you again for coming, and um, we're going to continue this morning through our series uh, called uh, Journey Through the Bible. We are uh, going to go, Lord willing, uh, this is school year from Genesis to Revelation, and try to uh, wrap our heads around the uh, magnificent story of history that God is writing and working, the story of which you and I are a part. And I think um, if we can grasp this, I think it will really change the way we read our Bibles uh, and, help, um, and help tie it all together. And so I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, but before we begin this morning, let's pray together one more time. Father, thank you for these men and women whom you have brought here this morning. And together, Lord, we lift up our eyes to heaven, to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of the Lord God Almighty, interceding on our behalf. And we pray, O oh God, that you would uh, open the floodgates of heaven and lavish, Lord, grace upon grace upon us this morning in insight and understanding in your word, not just understanding, Lord, but faith in the word which you speak. Faith, Lord, to believe all that you have spoken, that we may uh, go forth in lives of bold, confident, courageous, sacrificial obedience, knowing that our hope and our treasure is in heaven, and we live not for this age, but for the age to come. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, uh, so far, we've talked about uh, creation. A few weeks ago, we talked about how God created all things good, and he created man and women in his image to be uh, his uh, representatives of his authority on the earth, so that uh, he told us to have dominion over the earth. That is, we were to go uh, over all the earth and rule and reign uh, under his lordship and under his, uh, as, as agents of his kingdom, spreading his glory and his authority over all the earth. That was a gift given to us. That was the high privilege and calling that we were made for, to be kings and lords under the king of kings and lord of lords. And the very authority that God entrusted to us, we rebelled against. And it broke everything. And so man fell and sin entered the world and uh, they were, they, before the fall, they were innocent and they were pure and they were righteous. The, ba- the Bible says they were naked and not ashamed, but then sin entered into the world. And the Bible says they knew that they were naked. They tried to cover themselves up, and we've been trying to cover ourselves up ever since. Knowing, and knowing our guilt, but wanting to push it down and suppress it and hide it. And if we understand the story you will begin to ask the question, well, what now? Sin has entered the world. What now? What's going to happen to us? How is God going to make it right? Well, uh, we're going to see this uh, school year, but... um, But for now, we're going to continue the story, picking up where we left off last time, uh, with the birth of Cain and Abel. So, if you have a Bible and you're able and willing, please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to pick up in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Genesis chapter 4. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying... I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but 
For Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and wander on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The word of God. You may be seated. We're actually this morning going to be talking about hitting the highlights from Genesis 4 all the way to Genesis 10. But I just wanted to introduce it with this passage for you, this important passage. And we're going to see three things um, from this segment in the storyline of the Bible this morning. Number one, we live in a war between two families. Number two, God in the end will righteously judge all. And number three, restoration will come through judgment. Let me say those again. We live in a war between two families. God in the end will righteously judge all. Number three, restoration will come through judgment. First, we live in a war between two families. Uh, If you turn just a page back in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I said that this verse is one of the verses uh, in the whole Bible that's the most pregnant with meaning. Okay, it's the promise immediately in the middle of the curse that God is cursing the world and Satan and humanity because of sin. But right in the middle of it, right there, there is a promise that uh, there will be an offspring of woman who will crush the head of the serpent, who will undo the works of the devil, and who will restore humanity back to the height uh, and the glory that they were made to have in the beginning. But we also see in this uh, Verse in Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He's talking to Satan. What that also means, it's clear from the story of the Bible that that it's pointing to one offspring, a singular offspring. But at the same time, it's also referring to a history-long battle that will take place between two families, right? In that verse, God is establishing that there will be two families that as long as history uh, remains uh, unresolved, that there will be a war, there will be enmity between who? The offspring of Satan and the offspring of the woman. That is the righteous offspring, the offspring of the promise. Okay. Now, the question is, who is the offspring of Satan? I think it would be incorrect to say that it refers to demons because uh, as far as we know, uh, the devil is a fallen angel. Angels don't have offspring. Demons fell along with Satan. So who then is the offspring of Satan? Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, verse 38 and following, he says, I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. You know what they're saying there? When they tell Jesus that, what are they saying? 
Jesus was born from an unwed mother. They are accusing Jesus of being born from sexual morality, which we know, of course, is not true. They said, we were not born of sexual morality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. What does this mean? It means that when sin entered into human history, humanity divided into two. There would be those who would serve Satan and be offspring of Satan, and there are those who would serve God and be offspring of God, offspring of the promise, who is at enmity with the offspring of the devil. And so the world, uh, immediately after the fall into this present day, is divided into two families. Those who, like Satan, their ultimate allegiance is anything and everything else beside God, and those whose ultimate allegiance is to God and God alone. And those are the only two families, that, that's, those are the only two families that ultimately we can belong to. And so what this is saying is that, think about it, the devil's not an idiot. He's not so, he knows that the average person, um, the average person uh, is going to outright open Satanism, although some people are actually self-professed Satanists, but he knows most people won't do that. But you don't have to be a self-professed Satanist, according to Jesus, for your father to be Satan. All you have to do is to love, is to love, is to, is to want anything and everything else, to love anything more than God. Because if you do that, you do exactly what the devil does. And that is the devil wants, he, he, the devil wants to be the boss, not God. And anyone and everyone who has the same spirit that says, I want it my way and not God's way, you have the same spirit of Satan. And, and Jesus said, you are a child of the devil. Now, think about that. Think about how offensive that is. It's grossly offensive. And yet that's what Jesus said. And who did Jesus say it to? Who did Jesus tell it to? Religious Jews. You don't have to be a hellion to have Satan as your father. You can go to church every Sunday and be a child of the devil. Says Jesus. If you if you love yourself, if you love human praise, if you love the things of this earth, if you, you love comfort and security or anything else in this world more than God, and if your ultimate allegiance is to anything else besides God, you are a child of the devil. The, Jesus says, but if you have been brought from death to life, and if you have seen your need for a Savior, and if you have seen that only that you were made for God by God, and you see that your whole purpose of life and existence is to glorify Him because you were made to live forever, and if you turn from your sins and run and embrace Jesus Christ as your only hope of, the, of, of salvation, the Bible says you are born again into the family of God. You become a child of God. So let, let's go back to Genesis. We can, we can see that Adam and Eve, they understood this promise, right? And so when God promised them an offspring, it actually, if you think about it, it makes sense that Adam and Eve would be looking for that offspring, right? So what do we have after the curse, after the fall? Adam and Eve what? They have children. What are they looking for? The promised offspring. But what happens? They have two sons, right? Two sons, and they both offer sacrifices to God. One is accepted and one isn't. Now, we don't know for sure why God accepted Abel's and not Cain's, although we have pointers. In Hebrews 11, chapter, uh, uh, verse 4, uh, it says, By faith... Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, 
God commending him by accepting his gift, and through his faith he died. Though he died, he still speaks. What does that mean? It means that we don't know, we don't know exactly, but apparently Cain did not offer his sacrifice by faith. He did not offer it with a pure heart like Abel did. So Abel's was accepted and Cain, Cain wasn't. And, and we see the evidence of Cain's impure heart by his response. What does he do? He becomes jealous. He becomes angry. And the very, the, the, the second generation of humanity, in the second generation of humanity, a brother kills a brother. A brother kills a brother. Do you see what the story is trying to say? Do you, do you, are, are, are you connecting the dots here? What did the promise say? I will put enmity between your offspring and his offspring. What do we have in Cain and Abel? We have an offspring of the promise, Abel, and an offspring of the devil, Cain. Immediately in the second generation of humanity, we already see humanity is divided. There will be those who seek the Lord with a pure heart, and there will be those who don't. And so we see, so do you see? There is a war that's taking place. Cain, in the spirit of the devil, and, and surely tempted by the devil, killed the offspring of the promise. So you see that the, that the devil is trying to do everything that he can to what? To keep the promise from happening. Why? Because he's going he's gonna to die. God's going to kill him. So the devil is going to do everything in his uh, power to keep the promise from happening. So what does he do? He gets Cain to kill Abel. And if you're reading the story, what do you see? You see, well, what's going to happen now? Where's the promise going to come from? And that's why, and that, that's, so when you read the story in this light, it makes a whole lot more sense. Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, what happens? It says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. And for she said, God has appointed me, what? Another offspring. Instead of Abel, for Cain killed him, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. What is God doing? He is keeping his promise. He is providing another offspring, another offspring of the promise to carry on the line of the promise, to keep the promise alive. And in the days of Seth's son Enosh, it says they began to call on the name of the Lord. But and look at the and look at if and if you read the text, you see what's happening here. Well, we don't for time's sake we can't read it. But if you remember, Cain it goes through Cain's offspring, and one of Cain's offspring is a man named uh, Lamech. And if you remember that story, he kills a man, he kills another man, just like Cain did, and and uh, and he and he uh, and he curses anyone who would take vengeance on him for that. In other words, you see that. You see a, a bloodline that is committed to violence and evil and then a, and a, versus a bloodline who's committed to godliness. And then when you look at Genesis chapter 5, if you've ever, you, you could skim it real quickly in, in your Bible, though, Genesis chapter 5, what is that? It's a genealogy. It's a genealogy of uh, who? From Seth, the, the offspring of the promise, Seth, to Noah. Okay? What, what is this genealogy? You know, you, you, I'm trying to help you see. When you read the Bible, you think, oh, man, another boring genealogy. I got to read in the Bible. Now, here we go again. Another boring genealogy. No, it's not. It's the line of the promise. It's the bloodline of the promise from Seth all the way down to Noah. When you get to the book of Luke and it traces Jesus' lineage, it traces it to Noah all the way back to Seth to Adam. This is not just a, a accident genealogy just for information's sake. This is to tell you that God has a plan and a promise in all of human history. And he is working it through the bloodline of the promise. There's lots of people that were born in these times, but why does he mention these specific men? Because it's the bloodline of the promise. And you can even look there in, in, in verse 21 of chapter 5. It, it has a unique uh, 
an interesting uh, snippet there about a man named Enoch. In verse 22, it says, Enoch walked with God after he had fathered Methuselah and had other sons and daughters. Thus, the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. You know something interesting about Enoch? You know what number Enoch is in the line of genealogy from Adam? Number seven. Seven in the, in the Bible is the number of fullness or completion. Enoch, seventh from Adam, was what? He never died. He was taken straight to heaven. What does that mean? It means that, it means that this bloodline gives us hope that we too can walk with God and not face the penalty for our sins, but be taken back up to him. And Genesis 5 traces the bloodline right down to Noah. Noah, of course, leading us to the destruction of the world through the flood. But the point that I want you to see here is this, is that there is a spiritual battle that rages in this war. Okay? And through Christ... Through Christ, the bloodline of the promise is not physical. Through Christ, the, you don't have to be a Jew and I preach through Galatians, and that's what the whole book is about. Through Christ, you don't have to be a Jew to have the bloodline of the promise in you. All you have to have is the blood of Christ to have the bloodline of the promise in you. That is, everyone everywhere who, call, who repents of their sins and calls on the name of the Lord is a child of God, is part of the bloodline of promise, and is engaged in this war against the children of the devil. And this is a spiritual battle that rages to this day. The Bible says our war is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of this present age. Hear me now. The, the most important battle that rages today is not liberal versus conservative. It is not Democrat versus Republican. It is not uh, black versus white. It is not North Korea versus America or any other country. It is the, it is the battle of Satan against God. And if you're on the wrong side of it, it doesn't matter. You lose, regardless of your black, right, liberal, conservative, Democrat, or Republican. A billion years from now, the things that we get so worked up about, you won't care about. Believe me. But if you don't get this right, you will care about it. There is a battle that rages in this war, and all the devil wants you to do is get you distracted with everything else except the one thing that matters the most. And that is, to whom do you belong? Whose child are you? Have you been born again into the family of God by the Spirit of God? We live in a war between two families. Number two. Number two. God in the end will righteously judge all. God in the end will righteously judge all. The genealogy at the end of chapter 5 in your Genesis there, it ends with Noah. It, it pauses on Noah. Why? Because something really big happened during the days of Noah. And this is what the, uh, this is what the earth was like in the days of Noah. Genesis 6, uh, 5 through 8, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted uh, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So what do we have here? Think about it. Keep up with the story. You have men, and they have multiplied, right? And what has happened? It, it seems that the offspring of Satan is what? Is winning, right? They, they, when the Lord looks down on the earth, he says all he sees is violence and wickedness and corruption. And then from what we can tell, God looks down, and what does he see? He sees one man, one righteous man. And what does God decide to do with the earth? Genesis 6, 11 through 13. He says, the earth was corrupt in God's side and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh 
for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So God sees the wickedness of the world, okay? And he, and he, God is a righteous judge. He's not just going to let all the wickedness and corruption and violence in the world go undealt with, unpunished. So what does he do? He commits that he's going to destroy them. But he spares who? Noah, the only righteous man that's left. And how does he spare Noah? He has Noah build an ark, right? Noah's faith saves him. Because let me tell you something. You got to have faith to build an ark in the desert. If you don't believe God's word, there ain't no way you're going to build a, sh- a wooden cruise ship the size of one and a half football fields, n- not close to any body of water, unless you believe God's word. And Noah was righteous, and he believed God's word, and he built this ark in the middle of nowhere. And can you imagine what Noah's life was like? Surrounded by people who just... Seeking their own way, going about their own life, could care less about God, just have it going there, you know, doing whatever they saw was right and was fit. And here he is building an ark in the desert. Could you imagine things people said to him, the scorn he faced? But can you imagine Noah too? What does it say in 2 Peter 2 5? It says, He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness. What was Noah doing? He was preaching. What was he saying to a lost and corrupt world who is destined for God's wrath? What was he saying? Get in the boat. God's wrath is going to be poured out. And if you don't get in the boat, you're going to be swept away. Do you know how long it had to take him to build that boat? Do you know how many people he told probably to get in the boat? you know how many people got in the boat? Nobody. Nobody but his family. Think about what Noah represents. Noah represents, Noah is the savior of humanity. If Noah wasn't righteous, And believed God, there would be no humans today. Noah saved humanity by his righteousness because everyone else was swept away, but he was delivered. Noah represents a savior. He represents the righteous remnant, the family line of the promised offspring that seemed to be utterly losing in this world. But God preserved him and God preserved the promise. And the point I want to make here is this, is that God judged the world through the flood. He judged the world. A lot of people have a problem with that. A lot of people today have the problem with that. You know, why God, you know, lots of people, they, they, look, they read, you know, they don't, they don't actually read the Old Testament because hardly anybody who critiques the Bible actually reads the Bible. But they hear what other people say about the Bible and say, oh, that God of the Old Testament is just an angry old man, man, man. Okay? And that's just what they say. But think about, think about God made man for a purpose, and man now lives the complete opposite of the purpose for which they were made. If you, if you, make a, if you build something to serve a purpose in your house, and then every time you try to use it, it does the opposite of what you want it to do. What do you do? You throw it in the fire. Get it out your house. Right? Some people will some people say, how could God kill everybody in the flood? The better question to ask is, why did God save anybody in the flood? Some people look at the world and say, look at all the evil in the world. Why is there so much evil in the world? If God was good, why why doesn't he just take all the evil out of the world? One time, God did take all the evil out of the world. And let me tell you something, it didn't work out well for most people. When God took all the evil out of the world, he took, when he did it, everyone died except for one man. You sure you want God to take all the evil out of the world? 
You see, what the Bible confronts us with and what the Bible demands that we see is that it, we're, we're so easy to see all the evil out there, look out there, look out there, and God looks at you and says, the evil that you need to be most concerned about is right here. Because if you love anything more than me, if your ultimate allegiance is anything besides me, if you serve anything and everything that you want besides the God who loves you and made you, then you are of your, your father, the devil. And if you don't come to me, you too will be swept away on the last day. God was patient. God's wrath tarried and Noah proclaimed God's wrath was coming and nobody believed him. And it's the same today. The Bible says... The Bible says that God's going to do it again. The judgment in the days of Noah was just a picture, just a foretaste of what God promises that he will one day do again. Not with water. He promised he would never do it again with water, but this time with fire. And those who are of the righteous line, those who are of the, 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 the bloodline of the promise through faith in Christ... God is calling out people from the world to be delivered from the coming wrath to come, not by running to a wooden ship, but by running to a wooden cross. That is, that as in the days of Noah, we proclaim the gospel and we say, truly, and I say to you today, that the wrath of God is coming and the only means of escape is running to a wooden cross where Christ Jesus has died, where he drank the deluge the full wrath of God for all those who would believe in him, that if you turn from him and trust in Christ, you will be spared on that day just as Noah was. Matthew 24, 36 and 39. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day came when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In Noah's day, there were people waking up, going to sidetrack, going home, watching college football. And then the flood came. And it was too late. You remember the story of the ark? Remember, it says they closed the door. Who closed the door on the ark? God did. When the time's up, the time's up. We've had 2,000 years since Christ has come. That's a long time to repent. That's a long time to come to God. But let me tell you something. God is patient. But when time's up, it's up. We can go home and we can go carry on about our lives like this doesn't matter, like it's all just a joke, like the pastor's up here just playing games with you. But if you don't surrender your all to Christ and live holy for him and, and seek for his glory in everything that you do, one day the door's going to close. And it'll be at an hour you least expect. And it'll be too late. But it need not be because God has preserved his gospel Heralds of righteousness, you, me, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord to, to say this good news that the cross is wide open. There's plenty of room. You can get on board. Trust in Christ, the risen Savior, and you will be spared the wrath to come. So we live in a war between two families. God in the end will righteously judge all, and finally... 
God is going to restore the world through judgment. God is going to restore the world through judgment. This may uh, surprise you a little bit, but it's actually remarkably clear. I want you to see this picture with me. Genesis, uh, the, the story of Noah clearly portrays and is a picture of the future wrath that God will bring to cleanse his earth of unrighteousness. But not only that, but it's clear also that through the flood, something good happens. That is, after the flood, after God cleanses the earth, what does he do? He clearly shows that Noah is a, if you will, he's a second Adam. He is a new humanity. That is, through the cleansing of the earth of the flood, there is a new creation. It's actually pretty clear if you think about it. In, uh, for, let me just give you some, a few examples. In Genesis 1, verse 2, it says, The earth was without, was, was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then in verse 9, it says, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. So in the original creation, land was created out of the water. At the, at the, at, during the days of the flood, the new earth, if you will, the new creation, rose up out of the water as the waters receded. And not just that, but he, there's lots of things like that repeated. For example, um, in Genesis 1.24, in the original creation, God says, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, and animals, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. In Genesis 8, 17, he tells Noah, Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds, animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Another example of, uh, is that the command to be fruitful and multiply is given again to Noah. In Genesis 9, 7, he says, Be fruitful and multiply and increase on the earth. And then in Genesis 9, 6, again, he reiterates to Noah as that, that man is made in God's image. It says God made man in his own image. What are, what, why would God repeat all those things that he told Adam and Eve? Why would he repeat all those things to Noah? Because Noah is a picture of a new humanity. Uh, a restart. The world is cleansed of iniquity, and Noah has a chance to restart humanity. But you and I know what happened. His offspring failed too. And from his offspring, the same battle began once again, the battle between the offspring of Satan versus the offspring of God. But nevertheless, we see that this principle that God is ultimately and finally going to bring restoration out of judgment. Why? Because restoration means the removal of sin. And so the only way God will be able to finally and fully restore the world to the way he made it to be is when he removes sin. And if you believe in Jesus, it happened for you on the cross, but if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll be wiped out like in the days of Noah. And that's what the Bible says, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. They will say, this is already in Peter's day, Already in Peter's day, people are asking, hey, when's Jesus coming back? Can you imagine when, you, when Noah preaching the gospel, they're asking, when's the flood's going to come? Already in Peter's day, they're asking Peter, when's Jesus going to come back? This is what Peter says. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately... Overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow as some... Uh, to fulfill his promise is some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 
The reason why Jesus Christ hasn't come yet is to give people a chance to repent. God's mercy is tarrying, but it will not tarry forever. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all things, all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for that and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is, one day, as in the days of Noah, when God's patience and long-suffering is finally up, he will cleanse the world. And all who have not trusted in him will be swept away. But those who have trusted in Christ, they are righteous in Christ. The Bible says if you are in Christ, you are righteous in Christ. And therefore, when the floods come, you won't be swept away. Because, why? Because you belong to God. You are a child of the promise. And so I just close with this plea to you. The Bible says that like in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Everyone will be, there, will, there are signs and stuff, and sure, that'll happen, but Jesus also clearly says that for the most part, everybody's just going to be going about their life, not suspecting anything, and then the end will come. You're here this morning for a reason. There will be a day when God shuts the door, but bless God, it hasn't happened yet, and you don't have to walk out that door the same way you came in. You don't have to walk out that door under the threat of God's wrath. You can be, you can, you can enter onto the, sh- you, can, you can step onto the, the wooden cross of salvation. There's plenty of room. You can come in, you can enter into the family of God by faith in Christ, the crucified and risen Lord. So that when he returns, it will not be a day of terror for you. It will be a day of judgment. Why? Because your Savior has come. And we who have trusted in Christ, who believe in him, we have this unshakable hope that one day when all sin is removed from the earth, including the sin in our own hearts, by our resurrection from the dead, we will live forever with God in a world free from sin. A new heavens and a new earth where there will be neither death nor pain nor tears nor crying anymore. For the former things are passed away. And I would that everyone in this room have that hope.